All right. Got you back. All right. That was weird. Huh. Yeah, that's strange. All right. But, you know, like I said, hey, I just don't want to, like, have to do a whole lot of editing. <laughs> um, here we go. The enemy always gets a vote, right? That's right. All right. Let's do it. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm going to keep it going. But, yeah, uh, so congrats again. I was saying on the retirement, I know no small feat on 25 years of service. Again, a little bit extra for uh, for mom and pop there. But we wanted to, to talk today about Top Gun. So you got the Merge newsletter, so the Merge.co. I've talked about it several times. Encourage people to go out there, subscribe. You get a lot of good content out there. Maybe a podcast soon. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, what were what your initial thoughts, like big picture uh, Top Gun Maverick? I know we're late to the game here talking about it, but who cares? Yeah, let's get two Air Force guys to talk about a Navy movie. That sounds like a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Watching, judging. That's right. Uh, loved the movie. It was awesome. Thought it was better than the first one. It had a lot of a lot of great. Uh, the way they filmed it was great. The plot, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of points back to the first one. So some nostalgia pulling out your heartstrings. So I, I did. Uh, yeah, I did I appreciate agree. that quite a bit watching it. Uh, I've seen it a couple times. Um, and you know, the probably the feedback. Uh, there's two two parts of the feedback. I think the there's a lot of things that were completely unrealistic. And it's all of us that have uh, that have you know lived that life can instantly point out the things that are completely like that's not real or you know why would I put out flares against radar sams and you know things like that makes for a great mm-hmm. movie but again it's not it's a uh, as a as another uh, another podcast continually points out it's it's a uh, it's a movie not a documentary uh, yeah but there was one part of the movie and I, and I wrote a and I wrote one of my uh, newsletters about it one week I devoted to it that was like super realistic. But they never talked about it in the whole movie. And it was the entire plot of the movie was based around it. And they never even mentioned it, uh, which I, which has come completely backwards of most movies, I would think. You know, if you put that yeah. kind of effort into that kind of level of detail and then leave it all on the cutting room floor when it's like germane to the entire point of the movie. Um, I, th- I think that there's a, there was a missed opportunity. Uh, but this is why I, I, wrote, uh, I wrote a little bit about it uh, a couple of months ago right after it came, the movie came out. And that's kind of why we're here today. Yeah. Well, before we get into that, you know, I'd say we took our son to see it. Yeah. The one thing, his takeaway, he's, he's seven. So, Hey man, there's going to be, there's gonna be some, you know, adult language in here, words you can't say. So just prepare yourself, which every time something was dropped in the movie, like instantly looked at us, just like smiled and smirked. We were walking out. And the one thing was like, did you like it? He's like, I loved it. I'm like, what do you think? He's like, I want to be a fighter pilot. So I can say bad words when people are shooting at me. <laughs> that was his one thing. I was like, eh, okay, all right, that's not quite how it works, but yeah, fair enough. Well, it probably does work that way. But it's also uh, fascinating that you know Maverick got shot down not once. Uh, he, he ejected not <laughs> once but twice in the movie, um, and somehow lived without a scratch uh, both times, including at Mach Ten. <laughs> well, whatever whatever juice yeah, uh, Tom dude. Cruise is drinking, you know that's that's what you need to be able to survive that kind of stuff. Yeah, he's, especially a Mach Ten injection. Yeah, he's he's living his best life. I'll tell you what. You know the P fifty one in the movie that is actually his personal plane. I, yeah, yeah, I did see that, and you know, uh, there was thing. Uh, it's like James Corden. Did you see the? the yeah, that well, that was fantastic. <laughs> they did great. I will say, you know, my one claim to fame: Wee Willie, the other Mustang that shows up in there. Is from the Plains of Fame, Steve Hinton, the Air Force Heritage Foundation. So I've flown alongside Wood Willie. Oh, once. that's cool. I don't know if that was Steve Hinton or Steve Hinton Jr. flying around, uh, but I know Steve Hinton Jr. flies a bunch with Tom Cruise, which is kind of cool. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's amazing that I read a story that Tom Cruise, like he can't, obviously the first Top Gun, I think that planted the seed of aviation or always wanted it, but the fact that he went through and, you know, he's got a Mustang. I don't know if he's got like a Phenom jet or something. To, the guy's flying around again. Whatever juice he's drinking, it's obviously working. You know? And I, you know, you compare him to John Travolta for just a second. You know, John Travolta is like, you know what? I want to be a pilot. I want to go get a my uh, my ATP and and buy a what does he have a seven thirty seven or something? He actually has it's, yeah massive yeah he has like a seven thirty seven or something. Or Tom Cruise is like, I'm getting a P fifty one. Like that's just that's the yeah. difference between those two men right there. That's all you need to know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Fact. And you can see what happened to both of them. So, there you yeah. go. Uh, so the, uh, the, the plot, right. You, the newsletter you really pointed out, I thought it was really good. Um, cause in the movie, I only saw it once. I didn't notice like the GBU 24s on the wings, like in some of the scenes and spoiler alert. So if you haven't seen the movie yet, which if you haven't seen it by this point, yeah, they, they, I don't, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't, don't feel bad for you whatsoever. If you haven't seen it at this point and you're <laughs> listening to this podcast, dude, that's your fault. Not our fault. <laughs> yeah, like, be better. Uh, but 
you talk about the GBU twenty four and the the whole the basically the whole premise of the the attack and the mission they got to go do out there was relatively accurate. And I say that with air quotes. There are some things in there that you're like, well, that was that was pretty that was pretty special. I don't know if that was going to happen or not. But talk to me a little bit about what your thoughts are on like the the concept of the mission they were doing, how they're going out there and execute it, just the plot in general. Yeah. So the whole plot of the movie is uh, it's based around five things with a couple of assumptions. The one, the first one is GPS jamming. We cannot use uh, fifth generation aircraft for some reason. <laughs> like, okay. Uh, so we can hand wave that, but the, the strike mission <laughs> that they ended up like settling on, it's based on a, a few fundamental things. So it was uh, first, they had a very, very precise target to hit. Um, they had to, uh, it was in a very specific location that required a diving delivery um, in a valley. Uh, and so they needed a very precise weapon to do that in those parameters in that GPS jamming environment. So uh, in the movie, so Maverick kind of like looks at the video and, and not even 10 seconds goes by and he goes, this job will require a laser guided bomb. <laughs> And so that sets the, the, the basically the scenario for the rest of the movie. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, that is the last time that anything related to a bomb, uh, planning the attack, practicing the attack, the actual uh, release for the attack parameter, nothing the rest of the movie has ever mentioned. And there's sort of, uh, and so we'll, we'll go through that a little bit of, of why there's some really key tactical insights that they, you know, it's pretty accurate. Um, it may, you'd have to know about it in the movie and really the first time watching it, you might not even pick it up, even if you know about yeah. those tactics, cause you're just, you know, engulfed in the movie and just being present and watching it. Uh, but there's some really fascinating things, the details that they hit on that the next time you watch the movie, uh, uh look for it. Yeah. I, I know they had like a team of technical advisor. I think Ferg, uh, I think is a captain. I've seen him pop up on social media and a couple of podcasts and things like that advising, and so I know they had some tacticians, fighter pilots that were there really guiding it. And it seems like Tom Cruise, like he wanted to do it right and do it by the book. But it is interesting to see what got cut out because that is something, again, I miss. Obviously, I'm looking at the dive glide and laser gun and jamming. I'm like, all right, that all kind of makes sense. Um, you know, flaring off SAMs and, you know, some of those things. You're like, well, that's, that is what it is. You got to have some liberty when making a movie. But yeah, I wonder why that didn't get told in the story and again it probably just didn't make it to the cutting floor or make it past the cutting floor rather yeah and it could have been yeah it's, it's really interesting there's a lot of different outtakes you could have done on it like you know they're in the the scene where they first kind of come together in the in the bar you know th this <laughs> if hangman would have just said bob why the hell are you here <laughs> like <laughs> yeah <I'm, right. laughs> that would be like a pretty good indicator of like hey there's you know there's two uh f model crews and there's two e model crews in this scenario hmm, i wonder why so yeah, this it could have been a quick just nod to like, why is Bob even here? <laughs> right. Yeah. T talk to me a little bit about let's. I mean, jump into the overall you know the threat environment. Right? So we can't use fifth gen according to the movie, right? Because of GPS jamming. So why does that drive us to a laser guided attack for those listening? Yeah. So uh, three. I think there's three parts of it. There's the um, there's the JDAMs, uh, so your INS guided um, GPS aided munitions. Uh, they're not GPS guided; they're GPS aided. Uh, without GPS, the the JDAM, your Joint Direct Attack Munition, uses uh, an, a weapons grade INU. So it's not; it'll drift over time. So the longer it's in flight, the more it drifts, the more inaccurate it is. And the, the whole point of the movie is to hit a very uh, small sized target. Uh, I want to say it's like two and a half meters is what they say, or two meter target. Uh, or target yeah. two meters wide, I think is the, the words they use in the movie. Um, depending on how you're doing a, a JDAM, that may or may not be uh, optimal. And, um, and then you include the, the precision of the angle, uh, so it's not exactly a, you know, a steep angle delivery. It's kind of a, a sh relatively shallow in weapon speak, but steep for you know, if you're flying at speak, uh, delivery yeah. angle. And then I think that the other part of that is the, the obvious, if you're watching the movie and they do this, you know, the, the the whole tranche of like T lambs that fly over them, you know, well, why can't the T lambs just go hit the target? <laughs> um, if, if people don't know, like <laughs> there's all different types of T lambs or uh, tomahawks, um, uh, cruise missiles. Uh, and uh, for people who don't know, there's different blocks of them. They have different capabilities. Uh, but 
even in GPS jamming, the T Lamb existed before there was GPS, so it has a it has a Turcom uh, seeker, so it uses the terrain mapping feature to actually match the terrain uh, to go after its target. But even then, uh, you're looking at these the how small and precise that the target has to be. Um, the premise of the movie is like that wouldn't have gotten it done either, um, which they didn't really talk about that at all. Of course, the other option is I'm just going to shoot 50 T lambs at the target and maybe one or two of them will actually hit the point that it needs to. So again, that wouldn't be a very exciting movie if you just pushed a button. <laughs> just sitting in a control room yeah. and it's like, and it scene. And, and it's, it's yeah, all over. movie's over. It's a slow motion, <laughs> like the three, two, one, movie's over. <laughs> the super anticlimactic like most things yeah the the attack itself um you know watching obviously it is it's very entertaining and engaging from you know a viewer's perspective it would be a pretty sporty thing in my opinion to go out there and execute it what do you think about the way you know the whole run-in to the pop the, the delivery to flying out of there um what are your thoughts on that yeah well yeah, we could talk about we could talk about that, uh, but I think you can't really talk about that till you talk about the bomb because that really sets up why they did what they did. Um, so the bomb is a um, we we mentioned it earlier. It's a GBU twenty four, and that's a two thousand pound class uh, Paveway three laser guided bomb. Um, and they only show they never show actual full. Uh, well, they might have like one or two seconds in the whole movie where you actually see the full weapon on the aircraft. I think it's the scene at the end where Hangman has one on his jet. Yeah. Um, the very, very end. And all you ever see is a, is a few snapshots of either the Seeker or a fin in the background, but you never actually see uh, the bomb. Uh, it is not a small uh, bomb. Uh, so it's a 2,000 pound yeah. warhead, and it has a massive Seeker on the front that's several feet long. And then it has a tail fin. Um, where the, when the fins extend, uh, it's, a, it's a massive tail fin. And the reason why that has such huge fins and a big seeker, um, it was th where it was originally designed to be used for. So it's a low-level laser-guided bomb. So a lot of big fins to glide long distances without losing energy, which is different than probably the, uh, the Paveway 2 uh, series weapons. That I'm pretty sure you dropped a ton of them when you are in the Viper. Yep. Uh, yeah, I got a, there are a couple of lanyards back there. Yeah, see, there you go. Yeah, it, it's like a, <laughs> everyone who's uh, flown a fighter uh, has dropped a Paveway 2, whether uh, Air Force, GBU-12s, our 500-pound class, or uh, the Navy has the 1,000-pound class that they uh, they like. And interestingly, the the GBU-24 is one of the few 2,000-pound class weapons the Navy actually uses. Uh, so I thought it was kind of cool. They actually did a you know the cat shot off the carrier with the GBU-24s loaded uh, for the movie, which is pretty uncommon. They usually fly with the 500 pounders or the thousand pound class, so that was pretty neat. That's uh, one of those things that you don't uh, don't typically see. I don't know about the recovery weights, so uh, that's, I'm not a navy person. I can't speak to the fuel fuel ladder traps for that. Uh, yeah, it seems like it'd be quite sporty. You gotta get rid of those things. Yeah, I don't think they're the. I don't think they have the weight to, to land like that. They have to jettison the dump fuel or jettison some of those weapons. That's that's really why they yeah. don't fly with two thousand pound weapons. That's a lot of weight. It adds up quickly. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. Well, I mean, can you you drop GBU twenty fours in the Strike Eagle? Didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah. I dropped plenty of them. Um, yeah, they're uh, <laughs> it's a uh, it's a fascinating weapon. It's one of those uh, you know hero to zero. It's it, it's uh, it's a fascinating weapon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. So just so everyone's tracking. So uh, when we talk about Paveway two, we're talking about the teens uh, series or GBU guided bomb unit 10, 12, and sixteen. Uh, that's the, that's the series that are Paveway 2. It's got a very simple seeker with a, uh, uh, a microchip, uh, fascinating story of how that weapon was even developed, the Paveway. We could talk about that if you want. Uh, but basically it's yeah, a sure. ballistic profile and the seeker has a very simple logic with a thermal battery that just tries to do his bang, bang guidance to keep zeroing out the offset. And so it bleeds a lot of energy. It's kind of accurate, uh, but it's kind of a ballistic profile. Uh, the Paveway 3 is uh, much more complicated, much more expensive, um, and it's very, very precise. Uh, and it was developed actually during the Cold War. Um, and all this is important for of why it's so complicated. So it was developed during the Cold War for Europe um, in the mid-70s. It fielded in like the mid-80s. Um, but it basically uses a, a powered autopilot, and it has a, a proportional navigation guidance that minimizes those, that bang-bang guidance and those huge fins that let it glide. And then it has an altimeter and an attitude uh, gyro that's matched to that seeker. 
and that's a very sensitive seeker so it can actually detect uh, laser energy at very long ranges um, so that's the gb24 that's the 20 series there's actually a 22 a 23 and a 24 uh, most people don't know that the 22 and the 23 uh, never went into production. Those are the, the 500 and thousand pound variants. And that's why um, in the movie, the Navy has the 2000 pound variant because that's the only one that ended up fielding. Um, side note in that 20 series, the Paveway three um, group that we, that we call it, there's two more. That's the GV 27 and the GV 28. Um, and th that's kind of a story for another day. Those are, those are very unique, interesting weapons with fascinating stories behind them. Uh, but anyway, so want to talk about that. Yeah, go ahead. I do want to, I do, before we go too far, because you mentioned bang, bang guidance. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people know what that is. And then obviously we're talking about the different guidance profiles, quite different. Can you jump a little bit further down the rabbit hole with what bang, bang guidance is? Maybe an uh, anecdotal story of someone bad on the ground who might hear <laughs> the uh, GBU 12 that's coming down. But can you, yeah, can you expand a little bit on the bang, bang guidance versus uh, the GB24. Yeah, so, uh, sure. So, Paveway 2, <laughs> imagine you're driving your car and your brain is a Paveway 2 seeker and you're trying to drive down the road and you see uh, the, the end of the street, just trying to drive down the road. Uh, because your brain is a Paveway 2, the only commands that you know is with your hands on your steering wheel is complete hard left and complete hard right. There, there is no stop. There is no slow turn. It's one or the other. And so you drive down the road in this complete this way, that way, this way, that way, this way, that way to eventually get to the target, uh, hopefully. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, depending on uh, if, it, if it bleeds itself out of energy, uh, which it sometimes does and falls short. Um, that, that, is a, that is a thing that happens quite a bit with those, but it's inexpensive and it, and it works if you uh, can account for some of those, uh, those drawbacks. Where the Paveway 3, put yourself back in that same car, you get your hands in the steering wheel paveway three is those tiny minute corrections to stay in your lane to kind of get where you're going. And that is kind of the big difference between the two. That was a textbook like weapons officer instruction to a B course. Student, so <laughs> phenomenal job. <laughs> well, that's a great example. Thanks. Well, I'm like, it flips hard back and forth. Makes lots of noise. Um, <laughs> it's funny you see the so, the ground the ground to air cameras from like Combat Hammer and stuff when they actually show the the weapon, and the weapon looks like you ever t like go fishing and you know get a fish out of the water and you throw it on the dock and it's just kind of flopping around. That's how it looks in the in flight. It's flopping around. You're like, well, what is that thing doing? And then it ends up like you know spearing the target. Like how did it do that? Like I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> of course, then it falls I mean, short because it runs out of energy too. So both both things happen. Yeah, I mean, I think I drop like six in combat and then very, very accurate nail drivers, right? But give it enough energy, it's going to do its thing. And But yep. obviously there are times when that doesn't quite work. Yeah, it's got it's got some really, uh, really good things about it. It's got a couple drawbacks, but we've had them. We've had them since the 70s. Uh, so we, we know how to employ them very well and we know the drawbacks as long as you account for that. And we get a ton of employments because they're so cheap. Now that all of that's really important because now when you talk about the GV24, remember I told you like, like technically it is a much more capable weapon. Uh, in re reality, uh, you know, the results matter and historically it actually has a pretty low uh, hit rate um, compared to the Paveway 2. And that's because it's so complicated. Uh, so the mission planning is pretty complicated. It's not because it's so expensive. It's not something that people get a lot of sets and reps with. So you don't get a lot of experience yeah. of that muscle memory. Um, it doesn't have any automated mission planning like a JDAM, even though it has some complicating factors that would require it. And then the last thing is the environmentals can like make or break uh, the, the entire attack. If the seeker can't see the, the laser based on um, the environmentals of when it's supposed to see that laser energy, um, the weapon, uh, I've seen some, depending on the profiles, um, the weapon will fly four miles long of the target. <laughs> like, oops. Wow. Yeah. So that's not oops. a good thing to do in combat. Um, so I'd say historically, it's probably like an 80% hit rate between training and combat collectively. And it's a very complicated weapon. It's actually like orders of magnitude more expensive than a JDAM. And it's uh, hit rate is, really? yeah. And it's hit rate is way less. So it's a very niche weapon with a very niche purpose. That's uh, as our JDAMs continue to evolve in capability, it's kind of become less and less of a, uh, a tool and more of just kind of like, eh, it's there. And you know, it's eventually going to get phased out. We've had it for a while. 
do you know the price tag between like like a GBU fifty four, so a laser JDAM? I'd say yeah, relative one of the most advanced things that yeah. You know, so on average, get dropped versus like a GBU twenty four or GBU twelve. Yeah, I'd say the a JDAM in general uh, tail kit. Um, it's been a while, but rough math from what I remember. Again, I don't know, year dollars and all that stuff, inflation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yada yada yada. I'd say a JDAM yeah. tail kit is probably like thirty thousand dollars. Just the tail kit, you know. You're not talking about the uh, seeker or anything, um, right? You know, like a laser JDAM, the seeker is probably an extra five thousand dollars. Last time I checked, even if we call it ten thousand, so that total package is like forty thousand dollars for a laser guided JDAM. Um, right. A Paveway three is probably four times that. That's crazy. Yeah, it's uh, again, it's very expensive. Uh, old old technology, but it was done very very well at the time. But the uh, price was not a factor. In this, it was about performance, and that was kind of a key difference yeah. between them. And it does some really cool things. Don't get me wrong; I've I've dropped uh, I've dropped plenty of them. Uh, it, it does some cool things, uh, but again, if you do everything right, it I mean it, it drives nails. If you do it wrong, it drives off the range by four miles. Yeah, four miles. <laughs> Twenty thousand at yeah twelve. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like whoa. Um, that. It is interesting. Obviously, it was different times and, and different needs. Why that was created, GPS obviously did not exist, so drove that. Um, I never, I never looked at one. I never read about one other than it exists. Right? It just wasn't something that I needed to really to know about. But you and the the mighty, you know, big old Strike Eagle there carrying a couple GBU twenty four is no big deal. Can you talk to you, like some of those drop profiles that you did, and then tie that into the attack? that we saw in the movie as we kind of jump into that. Yeah. Okay. So, so first of all, the GB 24, it has, uh, eight generic ways that you can employ it. Again, this is all stuff that you just have to know. And there's some dials on the seeker that you have to dial in a pre-flight when you plan it. So there's, there's eight ways, if you will, there's four modes. And then each mode has kind of two options. There's an above and a below we call the break altitude. It's a certain altitude that's set in the, the, the altimeter that's in the weapon. And then, so if you have a mode one above the break, it sets a different flight profile with different attributes. If I set a mode two below the break altitude, that's a completely different profile. Um, so that's kind of general, like how you would do it. Within all of those profiles, um, a mode one profile is basically soft target. So it's the, it's the most accurate, but it, the weapon can and will arrive with some... Uh, it doesn't have rate dampening, so it's just trying to zero out that laser energy as fast as possible for the fins. Um, and then it does that at the expense of angle of attack. So when that bomb body hits the target, it won't, it won't, it'll have some AOA on it, which actually can give you some, some case um, deformation if you try to do it against a hard, a hard target. So your other modes, like mode 2, 3, and 4, have rate dampening and AOA limiting endgame, so it can actually penetrate. And those are made for hard targets, so you have a hard bomb body against a hard target. And I say that because the movie, um, that was a mode one, um, that was a mode one below the break um, employment. And I know that because that's what we call a point and shoot profile. Um, and again, this is, this is a key point of the entire movie is it's a GBU 24 point and shoot attack. Uh, and the reason why it's called a point and shoot is that when you're at uh, below the break altitude into mode one, and you release it, the, the attitude um, logic in the weapon, basically it, whatever attitude it was released at, it maintains that and it basically guides on that, like a, a, think of it as an instrument approach. So if I point and I put the velocity vector in the HUD directly on the thing and I push the pickle button and that GB24 comes off and wakes up, it's going to go to where the velocity vector was pointing. And that's a key point yep. of the very, very final uh, attack in the movie, which we can get to uh, in a bit. So that is a mode one uh, below the break point and shoot um, profile. Um, the other modes are there are some low altitude buddy guide trombone lays, all kinds of like weird trick shot stuff that you can do with them. Um, that's not what was used in the movie, but it's but it can that weapon can do all that stuff. Uh, the yeah. It's, you said that no, for mission planning wise, there's no GBU 24 profile to like actually run to go through. So when you talk, when we're talking all these modes, I mean, this is a piece for those that don't know. I mean, this is all like in mission planning for the sortie. Like you 
and what the target is and what the objective is, crunching those numbers, figuring out how fast you need to be, how high you need to be, depending on the target and, int and you know, intelligence comes from it. But the GBU-24 doesn't have that? Yeah, well, it requires – it's not a dynamic weapon like a JDAM is where I can just put the cursors, generate a target. And I mean, you could, but most of these yeah. profiles, they're, they're, we don't drop it off of a um, ballistic release point, like a Paveway 2. You release it off a desired ground range, which is this bucket that you mission plan ahead of time, and it's based on the target, the impact conditions, and the environmentals. And so you'd actually have to go get the atmospherics of um, the target area for the, the period of time that you're going to hit your target to actually figure out the laser energy required. And then you work that backwards to your, your, desire, your desired ground range. And then you have to figure out the laser dwell time between the two so the weapon can actually do what it's got to do to get at the right parameters. So it's, it is a kind of a complicated uh, thing if you don't do it every day and there's been <laughs> many a weapon in combat that has missed due to uh <laughs> the wrong environmentals being briefed by intelligence <laughs> strange yeah. so yeah very sensitive uh yeah you can go from here to zero like i said it's a uh, it'll make <laughs> or break you <laughs> but in the movie um so it's yeah. interesting in the movie they say that the uh the the ventilation shaft is three meters wide um and it's and i I kind of laugh when I hear that because the the targets that we drop these in training are shipping containers, um, it, whether it's at on the Nellis range or the, the white. If you ever seen the white shipping containers or the black squares, you know, painted on them, that's kind of what you're aiming at. Uh, or up at uh, Combat Hammer on the the Uter range up at Hill Air Force Base, and uh, the shipping container. So if you're GBU twenty four. Uh, they're so accurate that we don't just aim for the shipping container. Generally, we we aim for the side, uh, so like the doors on the shipping container, and so the shipping container is only you know eight feet wide, so that's two and a half meters, and so it's actually the target in the movie is almost completely representative to the targets that we train to with the GPU twenty four as far as the size. So I thought that was pretty uh, that was pretty interesting. Brought back some memories of me uh, hitting some some uh, interesting uh, shipping container deliveries on the Nellis range. How many how many GB twenty fours do you think you dropped? Oh, I don't know, uh, dozens. Uh, I don't know. But I mean, that, obviously, that's going through weapon school, I imagine, or if you guys. Yeah, we dropped quite a bit yeah. at weapon school. I've I've dropped uh, I don't know, probably dropped another easily another dozen or so just in ops. Um, you know, we have allocations and stuff, and then combat hammer, where we you get evaluated on on dropping some uh, different types of weapons, and that's one of the weapons I've dropped some in there. Um, actually, I've done a I've done a live. I actually did a live GB24 point and shoot delivery, like the the right out of the movie, actually, uh, out, yeah. at uh, Hill Air Force Base, uh, one year at Combat Hammer. So it was. Was your dive angle as steep as? Mavericks? It was definitely not. It was definitely not. It was it was it was steep, but it was not that steep. It was probably a, like a thirty degree dive or something. Which when you're in a thirty degree dive, it it feels steeper than than it sounds. I mean, thirty degrees is a pretty steep attack. I, I think the E10 had like a sixty degree attack at one point, which. That sounds just silly. Yeah, that sounds scary. I, that's yeah, yeah. That sounds like a roller coaster. I, I would not want to be on. Yeah, it would take the A10 forever to get to altitude and then then be able to do that attack. But yeah. um, <laughs> or I don't know. It's going so slow. It can point at the ground forever. Um, so let's talk about the attack. You mentioned point and shoot. Can you can you kind of dig into the you know the run in doing that pop and then you know that tactic and why that actually is somewhat legitimate okay so if you remember back in the and they only show it for, uh, for a little bit but they show like the ventilation shaft and then the ventilation shaft is actually at an angle down to the, the the nuclear facility underground it's not actually a vertical shaft it's a it's an angular shaft uh how they're able to get that intelligence who knows let's just go with it and say that's you know that angle that angular shaft is at a 45 degree angle and so the Perfect. the desired end state is one weapon blows open the shaft the second weapon, assuming the shaft doesn't collapse, <laughs> uh, is at the yeah, right I'm angle sure to go all the way down the shaft. Yeah, it's like the Star yeah, Wars yeah, thing, right? So to speak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is a blanket, so to speak, by the way. Too. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> blanket, so to speak. <laughs> so, so so the part of the attack, remember I told you a point and shoot kind of keeps the velocity vector. So if you plan a 45 degree dive on a point and shoot mode, the weapon is going to arrive at that laser energy at a 45 degree impact angle. And if it's the aligned with the angle of the shaft, so to speak, it goes down uh, and, and gets to where it needs to go to do its thing, right? Uh, so that's kind of the big premise of the of the point and shoot of the actual diving delivery of that. When I when I see the movie and I see the angle of the shaft and one of those like digital overviews of the the target, 
that makes sense of why they have to go through at a certain dive angle. And uh, JDAMs can be programmed with dive angles for end game. Hey, I want to be a shallow dive angle and you can program on a heading and a dive angle. Um, and again, the premise is GPS jamming would make the, um, the precision of a JDAM um, untenable to, be, to use, I guess. So reference the, the Paveway 3. Um, so that's, that's the, the actual like angular part of that. Uh, interestingly, the, um, there's the buddy guide aspect. So I don't think most people realize this, but in the, in the training, uh, it may, this might have been for, for cost. Mary told me the Paveway 3 is a lot of money. Paveway 2 is pretty cheap. Uh, if you notice in the training sequences that they all try to do and drop the bombs, they're actually all GVU-12s. They're all Paveway 2s if you look real closely. Uh, and that's kind of yeah. in the scenes. You can see them on the wings, the, the, your Paveway 2 secret yeah. you're probably familiar with. And if you can see the weapons hitting, the inerts, those are those are Paveway 2s. Uh, they're not Paveway 3s. That they probably just couldn't afford them. Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, and it, yeah, I mean, it's obviously the same tail kit and at four times the cost. Yeah, exactly. Because it goes, I mean, B core is pretty standard to, uh, I mean, it was drop an inert GBU 12. I think that was like one of the syllabus rides and then an inert, um, you know, GBU 38 just to go through the JDAM and then drop a laser guided weapon. And then that was it. And then I want to say, you know, prior to deployment, we are config going out the door was. Uh, 38, a 54, and two 12s until the fall or till the winter, and then as always undercast. So then we switched to all, all JDs. Yeah. But again, pretty cheap. I gotta go watch it again, you know, because again, till I watched it, I didn't notice the GBU 24s, and then, yeah, again, kind of immersed, and probably at that point, Jack's telling me, <laughs> oh, we just said a bad word. You know, <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah. yeah, so in the training sequence, there's two big, two big differences that are, and then the one that they execute. Number one, they're using Paveway 2. That's a movieism. Th I would ignore that. Most people wouldn't even notice yeah, it. Uh, the other point is that you know, when Maverick does his, like, I'm going to prove it can be done, um, he f he fl so he flies it all uh, himself and self-lases the bomb in, which is something that is not part of the attack profile, right? So not only does he get the timing and beat the, the timing that says it can be done, he does a self lays profile in this uh, you know 10G climb that's, uh, right. yeah, obviously it's a movie, not a documentary, but just pointing out that he actually did do a self lays <laughs> attack, which is funny because in the, in the final scene, it's like, oh, we can't do a self lays attack. Like, hey, you just, you just proved that you could do it. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's one of those movieisms, just push the I believe button. Right, yeah, you got to give it a little bit of credit. Yeah. I assume a dive glide attack in the Strike Eagle is probably similar to the Viper, of uh, you know, wheeling up, rolling in, checking away, and obviously two people on the Strike Eagle, so you're lazing it there. But mm -hmm. that's, I mean, it's still pretty busy. You got to make sure you're on your, all your timing. I would have, based on my ineptitude, a very challenging time to self laze in a in a ten G pull, <laughs> climbing straight up away from the the target. Uh, gimbal, yeah. So yeah, yeah. But it's Maverick again. The water, the water he's drinking, is dude. Good. It's amazing. Yeah, well, and again, most people, uh, you know, as a as a career backseater, you know, I'll tell you, like the the pod does a lot of the work. You know, it has a lot of tracking, stabilized algorithms, and things. And you're not. And there's been a few where it's broken, and I've had to like actually like keep my thumb on the pressure to keep you know the gyros spinning in the pod the right way to for the bomb to hit. Uh, but in general, like. You know, once it's locked onto its target, it'll it'll pretty much stay there. Uh, maybe a little care and feeding to get it just right. But um, and I've actually flown with the AT Fleer. I've I've fl I, I have flown in the Super Hornet before, so I'm, it's uh, I've operated that before. Uh, yeah. It's, How is it compared to like a sniper or a lightning pod? Uh, the Air Force pods are way better. Yeah, right. way better. Uh, they gotta spend money on landing gear, so. Yeah, when when I when I flew, there was a there was kind of a backstory of why the Navy never went to the sniper. So the sniper pod, if you guys don't know, it's got like this, uh, uh, I don't know what you would call it, triangle kind of shaped uh, glass seeker where like an AT flare or a lantern and even a lightning, they have a, a dome. Um, and so and you don't really think about it until then you have to do it. If you have a sniper pod, there's no way to actually stow the seeker. It, when you stow it, it just turns upside down. But it, the glass, right. is, everything is still showing. So... If you are in a, a, a very humid, uh, salty environment all of the time uh, when you're taking off, um, if that pod uh, lens gets a lot of moisture and on it, and it could actually like it, it pod wouldn't last very long. Number one, number two, it could actually affect like your ability to use it. 
So the they have a, all of their pods are stowable, where the actual seeker spins back inside itself, and, and so it's actually not exposed to the elements. And so that's kind of one of the big reasons, from my understanding, of why they decided to keep the AT Fleer and never went to the Air Force's Advanced Targeting Pod Program. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it makes sense when you think about it. Turns out the uh, ocean is tough on a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. There's it's way more complicated. Uh, yeah. God bless those guys. <laughs> Someone's got to do it better them than me, but uh, I don't know. There's something about floating around on a boat for nine months with 5,000 dudes. It just doesn't – it's just not my thing, you know? Everyone's got their thing. Yeah, I've, uh, I've got about 11 months of sea time, so I, I understand. <laughs> uh, story <laughs> for another day. <laughs> back to the, uh, so, the beginning. Yeah. So, so Maverick does this, uh, you know, self-lays, uh, you know, alone on a freight attack. Uh, in reality, um, they ended up doing a – GBU 24 point, point and shoot buddy lays, uh, which is kind of like a combination of a few different types of attacks put in the one. Uh, I think they did it probably for a few reasons. Number one, you can bring more characters into the scenario. And so the storytelling is a little bit better. Um, but number two, like tactically, they probably did it because uh, so you're, you're lazing, um, w- um, so your F models, which are number two and number four, um, if in Air Force speak, if this was a four ship. Um, actually, let's back up. So if we have two two ships in this scenario, okay, just so everyone's kind of tracking, the flight lead of the first formation is Maverick, and his wingman is flying a two-seat F-18, an F-18F, and that's Phoenix and Bob. And then Rooster is the other flight lead of the other formation, and then his wingman is the uh, Rooster and Maverick are in E models, and their wingmen are both in F models. And so the rooster's wingman in the F model is payback with fanboy. All right. And then hangman is in an E model on like alert. Um, and he comes and saves it at the end of the movie. Uh, so that's kind of how the crews and the formations are. So there's a single ship, uh, super Horn- or a single seat super hornet in the lead. And then a two seat super hornet as the wingman. And the, the, the wingman, the two seater has the Wizzo which has the AT FLIR pod, which is what's going to laze in the weapon that's coming off of the flight lead in each formation. So Maverick and Rooster are dropping the bomb and their wingmen respectively are going to guide them in. It's a busy, busy time. I don't remember how far in trail the wingmen were. Yeah, I don't know. In the, in the, you know, obviously you put them really close together for the, you know, for the cinematic experience. Um, right. Tactically, uh, you know, there's a point where it's when you buddy guy, there's all kinds of geometry and timing things and considerations. There's considerations between the flight lead and the wingman. And then there's considerations between the impact time of the first weapon and the impact time of the second weapon. Um, so, for instance, this this attack required two consecutive miracles per the movie. The first first weapon had to hit, then the second weapon had to hit. Uh, if the first weapon um was released too soon again not in the movie the uh the cloud and the atmospherics from the first attack would have actually masked the laser energy and that weapon might have missed the target and if it's too far away if they're too far in trail by the time that second attack happens basically maverick and um and phoenix and bob are basically being shot down above them because they're you know flying right up into the sams Uh, so that's kind of a tactical consideration that really wasn't covered too much in the movie um but the fact that their wingmen were really, really close to them in the dive, I think it's mostly for the, the theatric experience. Uh, tactically, if you're that close, you, you, why, why wouldn't just you put a four ship of F models to do it, right? <laughs> like you could self-laze right. if you're that close anyways, but it wouldn't make for the same kind of movie experience. Well, and the timing between the drops, um, that is something too. I think it kind of glossed over, and I'm trying to like backtrack, but I remember in the movie, you know, once the first fireball hits – um, targeting pods kind of depending on, you know, outside, I don't know, AT Fleer, I assume doesn't have a TV mode. I don't know if they can laze in TV mode. Yeah, it has, it has a TV mode. Yeah, they have an IR and a TV. T- yeah, yeah, so you uh, you have a big fireball uh, down there or the heat signature changes significantly such as the atmospherics that you allude to. It makes it very different. Uh, it makes the picture different and potentially impossible to actually designate on the target. What are your thoughts? On, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, having dropped uh, quite a bit of 2,000 pound live weapons on uh, on a lot of bad oh, people, uh, crowd pleaser. Yeah, it's a crowd pleaser. It definitely, 
it definitely makes a mess. <laughs> so uh, the, there is definitely an IR blooming that happens, and then your 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 EO modes, your T elect, uh, elect, electro optical, your TV mode. Uh, that's definitely useless uh, for a good amount of time afterwards. <laughs> if especially if you're within the exact that you're trying to hit the same target twice. Uh, yeah, that's that's fire. gonna that's gonna be so. bad. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting that they again another tactical consideration that we as uh, tacticians uh, definitely like I see that in the movie. I'm enjoying the movie too. I'm not picking it apart, but I enjoy those yeah. tactical nuances uh, as much as like the best fighter pilot out there. So um, yeah, yeah. If you, yeah, if you're gonna do it, yeah, if you're gonna do it right, then uh, absolutely this thing would not be as probably as entertaining as 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 it was. So. They, but I gotta give there it to go. them. They 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 got so many details right on this attack that yeah, yeah. a few of the things that they did they're like whatever it's it's a movie not a documentary. But I appreciate the the effort they put in. They actually did an attack with a, with a very special weapon that actually can do that very special mode, and. And but the fact that they didn't talk about it at all is probably cutting room floor uh, editing. Um, one of the last things about the about the attack that I'd like to cover is something else that's like super super real. Again, uh, not um, kind of glossed over. So, if you remember the when Maverick, you know, his bombs hit because Bob flying with Phoenix lasers in the bomb. Right? It's like Bob's the hero. <laughs> um, however. Uh, when Rooster releases the bombs, he's waiting for a captured call from the Wizzo from from um, Fanboy, and Fanboy is having targeting prod problems, and he calls Deadeye. Um, he actually calls Deadeye, Deadeye, Deadeye. Um, whatever you use, you use we usually use that uh, three times for a goalie, which is a different thing, which means there's a weapon in flight. My pods failed. Someone lays this bomb in. Yeah. Uh, goalie, goalie, goalie with, with a laser code. Um, but anyway, so he calls dead eye, which is the correct com brevity term to say that your targeting pod is bent. So there's something wrong with targeting pod. It's unusable. And so when rooster is down to shoot for his attack, he is waiting to hear, um, that confirmation com to release the weapon. Instead, he hears dead eye and he's like, Oh shit. And you can see it in, in the scene flips to his HUD. Again, these are the nuances. He flips to the HUD, and you can see him trying to put the velocity vector right on the target to, to push the pickle button. And the reason why he's actually doing that goes back to what I told you about the GVU-24 mode one point-and-shoot logic, is it's going to go to where the velocity vector is, is at pickle. So he's trying to set the weapon up to actually go to the right point, even without laser energy. So... It's a movie. It all works out great. The GV24, with had no laser guidance whatsoever from Rooster, uh, actually shocks the target, and the uh, hit the nuclear facility is down, and now uh, you're off to the egress and all the action for that. So that was uh, – I really appreciated that nuance in, in that last uh, – the attack scene. That was – you know, 99.9% .9 of people who watch the movie will never have noticed that. Right. Yeah, it was good that you highlighted that in the in the newsletter, which I thought was – really good and i have no experience with gbu 24s um and so like really i was like ah you know what like it obviously you go through you're looking watch the movie and again chalk away a lot of it's it's theatrics and they did a really good job uh putting it all all together because again to make it entertaining like you wouldn't want to make it truly real because it'd be really long so to speak yeah and potentially very boring but uh, yeah real real life is really hard and it's uh and it's not an hour and a half it's <laughs> or a two-hour movie it's, yeah it's you know life is not a movie but it is yeah, but it is rewarding kind of it is exciting it's and it's challenging and uh, i appreciate the movie i appreciate the way they tried to capture the the story it's really the story and um yeah it felt it felt good to just sit there and watch and experience it brought back some good memories yeah, I mean, who knows? Maybe people want to be fighter pilots again. Apparently, that's you know, that's a struggle to get people want to be pilots, want to be fighter pilots, yeah. which is just mind boggling to me. And if know? only we had an Air Force base fighter pilot movie. Strange. What if? What if? Yeah. I want to ask uh, before we kind of split off here. All right, so uh, we let's we can talk about the egress. Your thoughts on the egress, but really, uh, we can do the fifty thousand foot view. If you had this problem to go out there and solve. How would you go do it? What would be different than the movie? Ooh, well, uh, step one, I would not put humans in that situation. 
that would be, I think the, if I was the, uh, you know, the first step of every uh, combatant commander decision is uh, risk to mission, risk to force. So what is my risk tolerance? And if you're, you know, my risk to force is like, ah, I don't, can I lose, will, am I willing to risk losing people? In generally the American way of war is what can I do to not lose people? Which means your first, you know, five or six options on the table do not involve putting people in harm's way. And so whether that's a, like we have stealth cruise missiles, you know, JASMs uh, that, that could potentially do the job. There's very accurate weapons that will, can get there um, unseen. Um, you could do the TLAMs, which didn't require GPS, and just drop a whole bunch of them. Uh, you could send potentially a, um, a B-2. Um, if they want to put two people in harm's way, uh, and they have 80 JDAMs and just level the entire valley, <laughs> Uh, yeah, you could do that. <laughs> so there, there's other ways that you could have cracked the nut. Definitely would not have been as exciting. Um, again, these right. types of scenarios <laughs> in real life are generally um, baked in as, as contingencies. These are like you're on the third or fourth iteration of a contingency to put people in these kinds of situations. Uh, but it makes for a great movie. And dude, I'm a huge fan of uh, when people are put in those situations and when they like rise to the occasion – uh, or actually more accurately, they fall back to their level of training and preparedness. That's really what it really comes down to. And that's what I really appreciate about the human uh, side of the story is I this brought back some memories of a lot of a lot of worse stories I have of uh, mine and, and just seeing others um, being able to execute when things go wrong. Well, maybe I'll get you to hang around once we're done with the podcast. We can do another kind of there I was or tell some stories for Patreon supporters. But um, I think that's maybe a little bit of bridge to kind of what you're doing now as you as you move into the next phase, next chapter of life. You know, the human element, obviously very important. I think we're all fond of it. Uh, but the world's changing, you know, computer technologies. What What is it that you're going to really kind of venture into and how do you think that's going to shape, you know, the future of warfare and, and what we're doing, what the military is going to look like? Ah, put me on the spot. Uh, okay, Video. yeah, so... When I was looking for what I wanted to do, you know, you look at the, you know, China, 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 strategic competition, changing world, eroding advantages, all of those things. And you look at, you know, the, the air domain and, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, air power and an advocate. And if you look at like, what are the enduring advantages that we can invest in that will give us that generational leap and, a, go to a place that's going to be really, really hard for anyone to truly follow us. Um, yeah, you can go, you know, ex exploit our uh, stuff, you know, copy your F-35 and all that. But, you know, the dirty secret is the F-35 doesn't make the weapon system. The human makes the weapon system. And so having a way, um, oh, by the way, one of the, if we have, if the human is the critical part of our weapon systems for how we operate in the air domain, and as you know, like whether you do like a red flag or, you know, you're doing close air support, like, the, the complexities that you're dealing with with air operations, there's a human dynamic that is required to operate on a cognitive level at scale that's just so hard to replicate. You know, the you're flown with like a, a four ship or an eight ship where everyone is like an, an instructor and the amount of things that you could achieve, you're like, oh my God, I didn't even know it was possible. <laughs> Versus like a, your normal four ship where you're just like, four, don't hit me. Please don't hit me. Two, two <laughs> gear on the wrong frequency. <laughs> you know, so it's, and you can see those glimpses of that like peak cognitive performance when you have these like stacked formations of, you know, patches, like hey, I've got a four ship of patches and they're going to go out and just dominate. And like people come back. I didn't even know it was possible. It's like maverick level right. execution, right? <laughs> like, Hey, I'm going to do this. Yep. Watch. So you take that <laughs> same thing and, and you look at the human talent uh, problems that we have um, that have been, you know, they've been building for 20 years. Uh, turns out, um, they're not, they're on a path to not be fixed for the next 20 years. If we keep going, you know, keep doing what we're doing, we're going to keep going, we're going. So the human talent dynamic of capability capacity, whether it's, uh, you know, we do talk about an aircraft iron, you know, we buy new airplanes or buy, you know, keep older airplanes that are not less capable, but we have more of them. Same thing with humans, you know, it takes, you know, the, the running joke back when uh, we had the air crew crisis task force, when we stood that up years ago, was uh, General Goldfinger used to say, you know, you know how long it takes to, uh, to build a 10-year experienced fighter pilot? 10 years. <laughs> like, it takes 10 years. Right. Like, when that guy walks out the door, like, we've put, you know, probably $10 million or so over the course of 10 years to get that experience. And, you know, 
he votes with his feet because you know the the money that you want to pay to keep him in to incentivize him and lock him into this like a contract it's not a bonus it's a contract uh you know he yep. he has he wants to preserve optionality and there's other other options you know he can go fly an airline go you know fly for fedex or something uh obviously different quality of life different pay different mission different so you know there's there's a little bit of that dynamic but when you look at that you go okay well not only so if i have to do that for every single person to build i need 10 years to build a 10-year experienced fighter pilot and as you know even after those 10 years of experience, there is a huge range of capability between those people. You have your, Absolutely. you have your, you know, the 10 year, just like Mecca that everyone is like, man, that guy's awesome. Like, thank God he's here. Like he'll save us all. And then you have those other 10 year fighter pilots that are like, all right, you're going to be the uh, top three again, this uh, <laughs> top three Tuesdays, you know, <laughs> like, Hey, right. we need you too, but just not in the same way. <laughs> Uh, so there's definitely a huge dynamic of spectrum and capability, but the time investment remains the same. And so the, the, the question becomes like, well, how is there a way that number one, I can build a 10 year fighter pilot faster than real time. So can I build a 10 year fighter pilot in, you know, eight years or six years? And that's what like, um, all this, uh, um, pilot training next and this new generation of pilot training is what are the ways that I can have cognitive absorption experiencing faster right and i would say that's you know that's that's like bunting trying to win the world series right like yeah you you, you can you can get some bases you're not going to score winning runs though right uh, so what what i'm you do once. yeah did once yeah it, it, it happens it, i don't think it's a i per it, it's something has to be done the people that are doing it are amazing i love the way they're trying to think of novel ways to to accelerate the the, the training but when you zoom out and you look at the macro level problem, that's not going to actually fix the problem because we still have the retention issues and all the other stuff on the backside. And even after you fix that, you still have the human dynamic of the disparity of there's a wide range of capability between people. But the Air Force, really the military treats everyone exactly the same as far as capability wise. Like you don't get paid anymore. You don't get any preference of assignments. You're arguably the more capable you are, your quality of life suffers because you're you more you yeah. are the workhorse. Uh, the workhorse making up for the show ponies, as uh, some people like to say, yeah. right? Uh, I think if you've been on enough fighter squadrons, you've seen both both ends. So, yeah. so the question becomes not, not how do I build a ten-year fighter pilot in eight or six years, but how do I build a ten-year fighter pilot in ten days? That's the paradigm switch, and and the way that you do that is you have a cognitive proxy, if you will, to build a um, autonomy behavior, an agent, I like to call them. I don't, I, I don't actually like to use the word AI, an agent that can operate at a near human level of reasoning in those tactical situations. So once you can build that neural network and train it to do that, and that this, this agent, this highly autonomous agent, and I've done it once and say I did it in 10 days, now here's the beauty of it. So that's pretty interesting, right? So I've done 10 years of experience in 10 days. Now all I have to do is go copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. I just made you a four ship and they're exactly the same. The level of cognitive ability and reasoning is exactly the same. So it actually simplifies like scaling of tactics and force packaging capabilities. And when you look at, you know, things deploying, things deploying things. Uh, so think of like, I've got a unmanned, you know, big, say I've got an unmanned bomber type thing and it's going to employ these uh, drones, these autonomous drones that are going to penetrate. And then those things employ, you know, three or four loading munitions and all those, you know, six or seven or eight loading munitions are all talking to each other and collaborating and tar target sorting real time. Well, that is a level of, of cognitive performance that like it just outpaces the human's ability to do that. And oh, by the way, you wouldn't want a human doing that anyways, because you don't want to put that human in that situation. Right. Yeah, not saying that the machines are going to rule the world and, you know, turn around and kill us all. There's definitely operator in loop considerations. You know, I think people, <laughs> you think AI, that's why I don't like to use the word AI, uh, because it, there's, there's definitely a lot of baggage when you say that, whether it's like Terminator or, you know, Skynet, whatever. Um, yeah. But there's definitely like autonomy. Like, like, dude, you're a, Ran, you're a Viper pilot. Your airplane would not even take off without autonomy. Like, it wouldn't even fly. Right. Like your radar wouldn't yeah, work you without autonomy. Like nothing in your aircraft would work without autonomy. This is just a different level of autonomy. 
And that's, that's the only difference. It's not AI necessarily. It's just a different level of autonomy. How far away do you think we are from like what you're, the concepts you're talking there with a, if it's a, does it, does it look like a flight lead going out with three agents as you call them um, and operating, guarding a lane or is it, yeah, I know there's probably a mix, mix and it, it depends. It depends. Uh, so I can't talk too much about some of the things that, that I'm working on. Um, but I will say, here's, here's what I will say. Um, there will be um, highly functioning, highly functioning autonomy agent with a like tactical reasoning flying this year. Cool. So by the, by actually yeah. in a couple months and it would actually be flying by now, but the government sucks. So uh, <laughs> it would, it would be flying by now. So they will be flying uh, in a few months and, and you'll start seeing a lot of things in the news as we start going public uh, right now. The, um, it's, it's kind of weird. Most people think of it as like a far off thing because they can't see it. They can't interact with it. But the people who are developing it and are working with it go, oh, this is real. It's coming and it's, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be here really fast. In fact, this is one of those weird cases where the, the, the technology within the software framework is actually ahead of the hardware. So if we, we could build this, this um, autonomous agent to do these missions. We just don't have a platform to put it on because no one's built it. <laughs> In this aspect, because I don't know, uh, yeah, obviously I don't know anything um, other than what we've talked about here, but I think maybe, I mean, would you say it's a fair analogy or at least if not even analogy is the right way to put it, but how fast the world changed from 2007 with the introduction of the iPhone to what it is today. I mean, everything operates off a smartphone. I mean, it's integrated like every, you know, financials, communication, the world change, how I get my information, how everyone gets their information is predominantly through that little device in your hand. It changed the way things are done and it happened essentially overnight. And I'd imagine some of the things we're seeing that are going to be coming down the pipe, it's going to happen fast and it's going to change the way things work and the way we think about problems. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, you know, you look at, you know, why, why this, why now? And if you look at the, the changing operating environment and the level of contested operations, so the places that we're going to be asked to operate and dominate and communicate are all at risk. And the only way that you flip to a new paradigm, remember we talked about risk to force, risk to mission. This is the way that you move to a different set of rules. And so it, this is like the actual game changing piece. There's a lot of things that people say are game changers. Like game changer means you are changing the rules of the game. And this changes the risk calculus and the planning calculus of, of you know, it's a simple thing. Like if I have an MQ-9, my, my uh, appetite to send an MQ-9 to fly right along the DMZ you know, in Korea is much different than to send an F-16, a manned F-16 to go do the same thing, right? Yeah, and then absolutely. when you commit, uh, oh, by the way, when you commit a manned uh, force somewhere, you, there is a, a moral, legal, ethical obligation to plan, um, to have a plan to pick them up when they get shot down. And the tooth to tail on some of these missions as they get become like more uh, geographically um, um, stretched out over like the Pacific and just the environments, you know, hey, you're going to fly for... 10 hours and you know 10 minutes into the fight you're gonna get shot down like what's your what's your what's your csr plan like um i don't know like okay yeah. so we, we you know so there's definitely again the american way of war like we we treasure the human capital and so it's not to say that we're trying to replace the human we're trying to to minimize um where we need to put them and we want to put them in the right places for the right things when it matters and there's there's a lot of things that we can do that reimagining the ways that we do, whether it's like uh, penetrating strike or seed, um, OCA, uh, forward sensing is uh, a term that you'll probably start hearing a little bit more where you can send a wave of loyal wingmen ahead of you to actually sense and make sense of the battle space. So I, I can extend my sensor range by using them. I can extend my magazine uh, capacity by having them carry my munitions. And so there's other things that we can do to augment human performance and then replace them in certain situations where you can reimagine how you would execute some of those missions. It's interesting time. Yeah, it, it is it's fascinating. Like I'm, uh, I'm super excited. Um, yeah, it took me a while to figure out what I wanted to do. And, uh, 
yeah, fasc- fascinates the shit out of me. So uh, that's why I found out, yep, that's what I want to do. <laughs> it is cool. I'll say that I know I kept saying, hey, we'll kind of wrap up here. But if you read between the lines, so I was a casual lieutenant in an H860 squadron. And I spent 15 months there, and CSAR X was coming next year. That's what it was, and it was in the competition. It's happening next year. You know, it's finally happened, you know, 2020, the first, like, I think it's 2020, right? The first whiskey models of the H860 yep. started showing up. And then what last like two, three months with NDA just chopped it from, I think it was a 120 plus acquisition down to like 70. Yep. Because the need for, hey, where we're going to go and what we're going to do next for CSAR will hopefully be minimal. Or you can't, it's going to be a contested environment here. I'll send an HX. Yeah, and I'll tell you, it's a, it's uh, a pretty NDA. telling sign when <sighs> step one, the Air Force is a fixed wing service trying to buy a helicopter okay that's that's like a general that's that is just a cultural problem we've had for 50 years okay uh the army who is in the rotary wing business it's pretty telling when they're like we are, don't want to buy helicopters anymore because they're useless so they're all of their future vertical lift platforms are hybrid platforms they're not helicopters and the fact the air force is like no i think we just want a better helicopter like no no <laughs> you're doing it wrong you're doing it wrong it's not where we need to be so took 15 years <laughs> yeah to but, but the fact that like hey go versus. go look at the people who actually have thousands of helicopters and operate them for a living in all of these different dynamic operating environments and you go oh yeah they're not buying helicopters anymore so yeah the again i keep going but the anecdotal story i flew with a guy uh oh six retired oh six marine he was a reserve he retired out of the reserves but he went back did full military uh, mill leave full-time orders for uh, quite a while Part of his task at CENTCOM was figuring out how to get all the Marine Corps iron MRAPs out of Afghanistan. They quickly did the math and said it's going to be the entire FY budget of the Marine Corps to get those out. So he goes, what do we do? We turned to the Army because they didn't know they had a problem yet and said, hey, do you guys want all these MRAPs? They took them and then <laughs> we're out. You know, it's like that type of mentality. Like, uh, not surprised how we do I things. I love that. Know? That's awesome. So, Think yeah, smarter, not so harder. Like make no, step one, make it someone right. else's problem. <laughs> Why it's solve like, it when I can just and we're, move it? <laughs> we're out. Uh, yes, and then we donated the rest of it to, you know. <laughs> but what can you do? Um, Paco, any parting shots before we jump off here? I know we, we started Top Gun, and we really ran down the rabbit hole, which was fun to talk about different things as well. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah thanks for having me, as always. And uh, I'm happy to come back and talk about whatever uh, your uh, listeners want to chat about. So, uh, you yeah. know. If you're out there and you want to hear more about uh, me, or if you don't want to hear of me ever again, also tell him that so he won't bring me back. <laughs> but, <laughs> it works both ways. Unsubscribe, send me hate mail. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Either way, it's one or the other. There's no in between. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Paco, man, I really appreciate you joining me. Again, the merge.co, Paco puts out some really good content. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're going to start a podcast. I think I would find it very informative. I like reading the newsletters, but then again, you know. I can barely read, so hearing someone tell me the news is just so much easier. <laughs> uh, thanks, Rand. And keep putting out this uh, content. Yeah, I, I listen to the Afterburn podcast all the time. It's uh, it's my go-to when it, whenever a new one hits. Awesome. Thanks, brother. I appreciate all it. All right. Thanks, Rand.